hearts demand change. This song, performed by Viktor Tsoi and the band Kino, became the anthem of its time. It accurately conveyed the feelings of millions of people throughout the Soviet Union. The people did not want and could not live as before. The economic and political collapse led to the country's ruin, resulting in a surge of unemployment rates and a shortage of essential products. But at the same time, the Iron Curtain fell and the censorship eased. People started to reassess the larger values and reflected on the path taken. And most importantly, amidst all of this, a long-awaited moment arrived for the descendants of victims of the totalitarian regime. On September 28, 1987, at the initiative of Mikhail Gorbachev, a commission for additional study of materials related to Stalin's repressions was created at the Politburo of the Soviet Union's Central Committee. This was the beginning of a new stage in the rehabilitation of the USSR victims. A similar commission was established in Kazakhstan. The USSR's first rehabilitation wave took place back in 1956 after Stalin's personality cult was debunked. But until 1987, most of the repressed, including the leaders of the Alash party, were not rehabilitated. The 1987 commission began its work with an attempt to rehabilitate the work of philosopher and poet Shakarim Kudaybertola. Shakarim was de jure rehabilitated back in 1956, but for some reason a ban on the publication of his works was still in place. This attempt at his rehabilitation nearly failed as well, running into a number of obstacles. Actually, Shakarim was killed three times. The first time when they shot him without trial or investigation. The second time when his creative heritage was destroyed. And a third time when they tried to erase his name from our history after rehabilitation. Who was behind these persecutions and why? And who really was Shakarim? Let us try to figure it out together. He was born on July 11, 1858, in the Chinggis Volost of the Semipalatinsk district, in the area that today bears the name of his uncle, Abai. Yes, he is Abai's nephew, the son of his elder brother, Kudai Birda. Shakarim's father passed away early, and so his grandfather, Kunanbai, took his upbringing upon himself. In fact, it was Kunanbai who chose the name Shakarim. He found it in religious books. The name should sound as Shah Kerim, Kerim meaning generous, charitable and caring in Arabic. But slowly, people started calling him in a Kazakh manner rather than Arabic. They called him Shakarim, and this is the name that went down in our history. Shakarim's mother, Tulibike, was an exceptional woman. She belonged to the Karagisek clan and enjoyed great respect among them for her kind and compassionate nature. Tolibike was known as a skillful needlewoman. She knew how to do it all – sewing, embroidery, laying out ornaments. She even possessed blacksmithing skills. Shakarim's mother also helped the poor and the underprivileged. Most likely, it was from his mother that Shakarim inherited a sensitive heart which led him to philosophy and spirituality, turning him away from bad things. Little Shakarim's temperament, his perception of this world, can be judged from this poem, which he wrote at the age of eight, accidentally killing a beetle. Here, listen, you have killed, but tell me, what good is it to you? In the expanse of the steppe, I just lived, as best as I could. And it's not my place to say, what is death like? How the grass on the grave holds you close and tight. You orphan children, forgetting yesterday's affair. Where is your father? Tell me, where is he? Where? Pity the orphan. Pity the orphan, you little orphan. Maybe your heart is empty inside. You little orphan. Pustata. 
Soon the whole neighborhood was talking about a little genius growing up in Kulumbai's house. Abai also noticed Shakarim's talent. He always tried to find time to tutor his nephew, whom he basically considered a younger brother. Having once plunged himself into the world of books, and there were many in the house, Shakarim could never abandon reading. Books have been his trusty companions all his life. When he will grow up, he will write his own poems. But for now, he reads the poetry of the East with enthusiasm and listens to the tales his uncle Abai tells him. They were very close. The pursuit of truth and wisdom united them both. When Shakarim grew up, they complemented each other. Their relationship developed in four directions. First, they were blood relatives. The second direction was poetry. Shakarim is a prominent representative of the Abai school of poetry. The third direction was the development of ideas. Since Shakarim not only learned from Abai, but also continued to develop Abai's ideas after his death, he managed to deepen and expand the scope of new Kazakh poetry, as well as Kazakh philosophy. The fourth direction was continuity. Abai viewed Shakarim as a successor who would not only continue his work, but also surpass the teacher in some way, which is what happened. Later, Ali Khan Bukei Khan, commenting on Shakarim's work, Khalkhaman Mamar, would say, while Abai was alive, Shakarim hit his neck. This statement says a lot. Shakarim had many talents. He mastered multiple musical instruments, knew several languages, composed music and was, in general, a jack of all trades. He got these talents from his craftsperson of a mother as well, he even sued his own clothes. Aware that death is inevitable, you still believe in your immortality. And though the crime is reprehensible, retribution fails to instill fear, you see. Countless good deeds await, untapped. Yet you revel in doing not. The Lord's blessings you've unwrapped, but limits you choose to ignore, thought. Though a man bound to wealth and treasure, in the final hour truth shall reveal. You sold your soul without measure. No salvation from the grave surreal. This poem conveys the depth of thought that the adult Shakarim possessed. It speaks of his philosophical views on life, death, good and evil, which took up all his being. Like his uncle Abai, he accurately sees the vices that plagued the Kazakh society of the time. He speaks of vanity and pride, of the fact that the desire of his kin for wealth and power is shallow and worthless, since they bring neither happiness nor deliverance from the encounter with oneself and the Almighty on the deathbed. In the final hour, truth shall reveal, Shakarim writes, as if calling his people to obtain spiritual growth, do good deeds and serve the good. Despite his rather young age, Shakarim enjoyed such respect and authority that even older people of the highest social status came to him for advice. An interesting fact of young Shakarim's life. He was never involved in any confrontations. He was a strong, athletic young man the best hunter in the area, with excellent physical features and great strength, but he was ready to show it only on one occasion, in contests. He never used his strength against people for a showdown or to prove himself. Inter-clan conflicts happened a lot at that time. But Yang Shokarim explained to his kin that one should not see a man as a rival just because he was from a different clan. Time and time again he acted as a mediator in various disputes, which is why his grandfather Kunanbai decided to make Shakarim his successor. He blessed his grandson for the position of Volos governor with the following words. 
I have always relied on the people. You should also take note of people with pure thoughts and help the poor using the power where necessary. And never think people are bad even if they oppose you. The time of Shakarim's growing up fell in the most difficult period in the history of the country. It was the time of total colonization by the Russian Empire. It was the time that poets would call Zarzaman, or the Age of Sorrow. Everything in this world has two sides. On the one hand, such a deep integration with Russia helped the Kazakhs to solve the issues of education, science and medicine. And on the other hand, the traditional way of life of the Kazakhs was destroyed. The new socio-economic structure of the society led to moral degradation and loss of spiritual values. Зачем в один момент ломать традиционный уклад жизни? Why break the traditional way of life all at once? Why break the traditional economy, which is associated with climate, geographical and natural conditions? Условиями, поэтому вот те трагические события коллективизации. The tragic events of collectivization once again showed that the desire for a better life without taking into account the interests of the people, including of the material interests of the people, leads to tragic end. For example, according to various sources, during the years of collectivization, one and a half million people died of starvation in Kazakhstan. There are also researchers who say that more than 2 million, approximately 3 million people died of starvation at that time. Such events show that Shakarim certainly did not pay attention to political slogans, but he first of all looked at the specific decisions of the authorities, the representatives of the Bolshevik party, and realized what it all could lead to, which is why he did not agree with such an economic policy. The young Volost governor Shakarim differed radically from his predecessors and followers, because he took care of not only economic and domestic issues. He considered the establishment of peace and mutual understanding in the steppe to be the most important thing in his work. And he found success. Relying on national traditions of hospitality and mutual assistance, Shakarim achieved the establishment of absolute peace in Chingiz Volost. No one quarreled over grazing territories anymore and cattle theft ceased. As we know, the Soviet propaganda presented all the rich and powerful people of that time as some kind of a blood-sucking feudal lord who profited from the misfortunes of their people. In fact, this was not the case. The head of the clan was responsible for the entire village and always helped those who found themselves in a difficult situation. The prosperity of his family, his village and his region was the main indicator of his personal wealth and character. If it were not for our national traits, such as compassion and mutual assistance, had they not been instilled in us for decades and literally embedded in our national code, then it's unlikely that the Kazakhs would have survived the hard times, famine and devastation. If not for these qualities, absorbed for centuries with mother's milk, we would hardly have saved so many representatives of other nationalities who arrived here during the deportation. In 1878, Shakarin turns 20. It is time for him to marry. In those days, marriage was primarily a strategic task, and the feelings of the young were not the first consideration, if at all. The interests of the clan were paramount. Such was the case with Shakarim's first wife. Mawen was chosen for Shakarim by the elders and his grandfather Kunanbai, whom Shakarim could not disobey. A year later, Mawen gave her husband his firstborn son. The child's great-grandfather Kunanbai also came to the celebration. Traditionally, he was the one to give the boy a name. He named him Abu Sufyan. Shakarim treated Mawen with great respect and reverence, but his heart was desperately short of love. He felt that he still haven't met his soulmate. 
This condition can be traced in his poems. O oh, weary heart, ablaze with pain, yet my hopes in darkness wane. Will, vigor, and thoughts dissipate, leaving my empty heart desolate. One day he saw her, the beautiful Ayrancha. She was an Orai, and they usually do not take more than one wife. The girl's father made it clear to the enamored Chakarim that he did not approve of his attempts to get close to Ayran Shah. Chakarim himself was tormented. He did not know how to tell the devoted Mawin that he wanted to take a second wife. Would she understand? He suffered and dedicated poems to Ayran Shah. Not to my delight, you crossed my sight. Ensnared in the web of sorcery smite, you gaze enticed, my head in a whirl. I'd sacrifice my life for you, dear girl. In the end, having received the girl's consent, Chakarim simply took her away to his house. The Abai himself volunteered to settle the matter, so that no inter-clan conflict would arise. He ordered Chakarim to pay the relative of Ayran Shah a huge kun of 50 camels and 25-year-old horses. In those years, such a number of cattle was a fortune and Chakarim did not have such wealth. Thankfully, the relatives helped. And as it later turned out, not in vain. Chakarim and Ayran Shah loved each other very much. They carried their feelings through many years and had many children, five sons and three daughters. His uncle Abai continued to exert a huge influence on the already grown-up Shakarim. In the most difficult historical conditions, he was a spiritual guide not only for his relatives, such as Shakarim, but he was a beacon for all his people. Aware of the situation in which the people found themselves, he offered his own way of preserving their national identity and freedom, but not with the help of armed resistance, which was brutally suppressed each time but by building up inner strength through enlightenment. He mastered the Russian language through which he discovered world literature. He also befriended political exiles who opposed the Tsarist administration. Alexander Black, Evgeny Mikhailis, Apollon Karelin, Nifon Dolgopolov and many others. Abai introduced Shakarim to these educated people as well. They talked about the sciences, including sociology, psychology, and analyzed the prospects for the country's further development. With time, increasingly realizing that it was beyond the power of the Volist governor to turn the life of the nomadic people into a more prosperous direction, because of the limitations and administrative restrictions, Shakarim increasingly began to think about wanting to change his path completely. The time came when Shakarim decided not to seek re-election. Instead, he decided to devote himself entirely to poetry. In the spring of 1890, Shakarim wrote the poem Khalkhaman and Mamur, which immediately became popular, as well as his philosophical poems The True and the False, for example. Pray, where dwells thought and reason's domain? In what form within this mortal frame? To know, to like, to believe, mind's traits. But when do they prove truly great? Ears perceive sound, flesh can feel. Eyes provide vision, nose detects with zeal. Tongue tastes flavors, their signals stream. Mind judges, discerning good or mean. These poems were absolutely original for that period. Never and no one before him dealt so deeply into the nature of human feelings. Shakarim's subsequent years were very fruitful. The Mirror of the Kazakhs, Notes of the Forgotten, Nartailak and Aisulu, The Death of Khodar, Adil and Maria, stories united under the title Baishishek Garden. 
Today, many of his works are classics of our literature and theatrical art. The Kazakh drama theater began its development with Shakarim's poem Yenglik Kibek, which was staged on January 13, 1926, by the classic of Kazakh literature Mukhtar Awezov. Shakarim's lyrics, epics, poems are very deep, polyphonic, and multi layered works. But what I want to highlight is Shakarim's philosophical lyrics. In Soviet times, there was the concept of Russian philosophy and there was the concept of German philosophy, but not even a word of Kazakh philosophy, as if the Kazakh nation was unable to think. But the Kazakh philosophy existed and Shakarim was its representative. Nowadays, since we gained our independence, we have an opportunity to study Kazakh philosophy. And this is where the works of Shakarim come to the fore. For example, consider a saying, make the mind a prophet. In it, he takes the meaning of the human mind to a whole new level. And there are many more such philosophical thoughts. Shakarim's work is multifaceted, fascinating, and needs more research. The year 1904 was a turning point in Shakarim's life. His mentor, teacher and brother, Abai Kunanbaev, died. It was a tragedy not only for a single person, family or clan. It was a tragedy for the whole country. Wishing to fulfill Abai's last will, Shakarim left for Hajj to Mecca in 1905. This journey radically changed his worldview, because he not only fulfilled his duty as a Muslim, he also found new knowledge. He traveled to Istanbul, where he visited the best libraries, discovering new worlds of Oriental poetry and literature. He also traveled to France and worked in Parisian libraries and archives, where he found unique historical data about the origin of his own people, the Kazakhs. This is how the book The Genealogy of the Turks, the Kyrgyz, the Kazakhs and the Huns came to be. One of Shakarim's sons, Ahat, said that Shakarim brought back a lot of books from that trip and the ones he could not bring himself, he sent as parcels. February 1907, a movement of young Kazakh intelligentsia, led by Alihan Bokihan, was actively forming in Kazakhstan. Preparations were underway for election to the second State Duma. At Bokihan's suggestion, Shakarim was nominated as a candidate for the State Duma from the Semipalatinsk Regional Committee of the Party of People's Freedom. However, Shakarim declined the offer. For example, representatives of the Kazakh intelligentsia raised language issues, raised religious issues, raised the issues of education, raised issues related to the resettlement policy, agrarian issues. But Shakarim understood that in those historical conditions the state Duma was unable to resolve these issues at the legislative level. Which is why Shakarim believed that he needed to act more in the direction of enlightenment, education, in the direction of the moral self-improvement of the people. The First World War. A royal decree was issued on June 25, 1916, ordering the mobilization of Kazakhs to work in the rear. A wave of national liberation uprisings covers Kazakhstan. The leaders of Alash movement address the people from the pages of the Kazakh newspaper, saying, we cannot refuse to do that, the authorities won't forgive us. They can legally take punitive measures, troops will enter the steppe, the people will be deprived of peace. Martial law for the people is tantamount to a catastrophe. 
Yalash members were absolutely right. The uprisings were suppressed by punitive operations. Of course, in the end, many Kazakhs, including Shakarim, perceived the revolution of 1917 and the overthrow of the Tsarist regime as liberation from oppression, as a chance for a new life. The Bolshevik slogans were very attractive. Power to the people, we will build a new world. However, it soon became clear that the Bolsheviks were unable to improve the life of the Kazakh population. On the contrary, the reforms initiated by the Reds in the steppe led to an even greater crisis and poverty. Shakarim writes. By taking away property from the rich and distributing it to the poor by equalizing their rights, we thereby accustom parasites and inferiors to idleness and laziness that are destructive for them. Therefore, this idea is inhumane and has no basis in itself. People who have reason and conscience, who have a sense of mercy for their brothers, cannot live by exterminating, destroying one another. He openly opposed collectivization, equalization, and the people listened to him, which caused extreme discontent on the part of the new government. The Joint State Political Directorate, a secret service of the time, tried to recruit Shakarim and win him over by various means, but it was not possible. After all, he saw that the situation in the steppe was worsening every year as the confiscation of property and famine began. Shakarim's kind, sympathetic heart ached as he watched all that happen. He decided to seclude himself and live as a hermit, devoting all his remaining energy to his creative work, so that by reading his works, people would gain strength and reason to keep on living. He also translated Russian and world classics into Kazakh. The famous journalist Sabarjan Gabasov wrote in the ICAP magazine the following. There is no one who wouldn't know the esteemed Ibrahim, aka Abai. He was a brilliant poet and philosopher, Although people did not appreciate his talent enough in his lifetime, today everyone misses him. After the passing of Qunanbai and Abai, today Shakarim, the son of Qudaybirda, stands before the eyes of the public as a respected elder, as Aqsaqal. When you take in hands the books of this man and read them, you involuntarily think what was the grandfather of Aqsaqal writer, late Qunanbai Qajar like. And what was his uncle Abai like? Today, the esteemed Shakarim works with a pen for the benefit of his people. He is a good example for those who, being content with silver bridles and saddles, getting drunk and growing a huge gut, becoming arrogant and presumptuous when people start calling him a Haji. May the life of such Aksakals as Shakarim be blessed. Let the young people aspire to be like Shakarim. He possessed inner freedom, you see. Freedom means independence. And this philosophy of inner freedom he promoted through his writings. Each of his works awakened the people's consciousness and lifted its spirit. And the system, of course, did not need the people like him. The system was atheistic in nature. And such a prominent figure speaking about faith, about spirituality, about freedom of the mind and will, such a person was a hindrance, an obstacle in the task of promoting the ideology of communism. He always used to say that a person needs to seek the soul and the truth and improve morally by diving into religion. But of course, he considered all this in the context of his philosophical concept of conscience. We use the word conscience in everyday life, but Shakarim viewed it in more ways than one. He viewed it as a conscious choice between personal interests and public interests, as a conscious choice in favor of the common interest, 
public interest, the nation's interest. Shakarim's approach is still relevant today. We live in the 21st century and we still witness religious conflicts taking place. We see how scientific achievements are used today to produce new kinds of weapons. We see the situation in the world, including the post-Soviet countries. And yet, the real way out of these crises is what Shakarim talked about. Outstanding historical figures have always emphasized the need for humanism. And Shakarim was one of the most consistent humanist philosophers, both in his work and in his real life. On February 1, 1930, Shakarim's eldest son, Gafur, was arrested. His son, Bayezid, Shakarim's grandson, was arrested along with him. All their livestock and property were confiscated. On July 6 of the same year, Gafur died in prison. The documents claim that he committed suicide by slitting his own throat. But knowing the investigation methods of contemporary authorities, the suicide version does not hold. Shakarim spent a whole year in mourning for his son, dedicating him poems. No person now enjoys true freedom's light in this era of dictatorship's might. Nightmares of the century shall unfold as life imbues horror and passions bold. This poem of Shakarim's turned out to be prophetic. It only got worse as the time went by. Entire families were dying. In September 1931, a Kazakh uprising broke out in the Semipalatinsk region. An NKVD detachment led by Abzal Kharasartov was sent to suppress it. This detachment dealt harshly with the rebels. And on October 3rd, 1931, Shakarim was also killed. The testimony of the Cheka secret police officers from the Shakarim case varies. But one fact remains unchanged. The order to shoot to kill was given by Abzal Karasartov. Secret police officer Aitmarza Tunlikbaev. When ordered, the people began to take off the dead old man's weapons and clothes. The wolf coat, the hat, boots, quilted kaftan, pants, everything was removed. The blood-stained old man was left lying on the frost-covered ground in his white underwear. The chief yelled at me. Why didn't you take anything? What do I have left? I was offended. Take him then. Take him to Bakanas, he ordered me. Shakarim's body was indeed taken to the Bakanas village and put on display for everyone to see. Secret police officer Karasartov even made the following speech. You see in front of you Shakarim, previously a respected elder among the people, a god-seeker who visited Mecca and Medina, and a poet who wrote the Yingli Quebec poem, a person that wanted to besmirch the Naiman clan. Look at how he ended up, died in a shootout. In his testimony, Karasartov calls Shakarim an outlaw, saying that he was armed and was the first to open fire, trying to kill a representative of the authorities. However, this testimony does not stand up to any criticism, because everyone around knew Shakarim as an excellent hunter, who had not lost the sharpness of his eye, even with age. And if he had really been the first to shoot at the police officers, it is unlikely that they would have made it unharmed. The officers did not even bury Shakarim's body properly. They dumped it into this old well where it had been laying for almost 30 years. Only after rehabilitation, Shakarim's son Ahat extracted his father's remains from the well. Again, why did the secret police officers who later wrote reports about the uprising and the death of Shakarim dumped his dead body into a well? Shakarim's 
Но ведь можно было передать родственникам. They could have, after all, given the body to Shakarim's relatives for proper burial, considering the man's influence, considering his role, his position in the Kazakh society. Ведь можно было это все сделать. Значит, каким-то образом... They could have easily done it. It means that they didn't want anybody to have an opportunity to check whether their report was true. Basically, it was an attempt to hide the evidence of Shakarim's murder, so that no one could check the facts again. Ahat was the only son of Shakarim who managed to survive. He's been through camps and persecution, but miraculously survived. We haven't discussed the fate of his son, Zayat, who managed to leave for China during these events, managed to cross over to the Chinese side. While being there, he protected the interests of the Kazakhs in China. He took part in addressing the issues they faced there. But according to one publication, he died in China in 1937. В разных публикациях есть разные версии, но фактически вот... It is unclear what happened there. Different publications offer different versions. But basically, only Shakarim's son, Ahat, lived long enough to see the rehabilitation of his father. He was active in teaching and research and was the head of a museum. ...преподавательской и научной деятельностью, руководил музеем. Shakarim's legacy was destroyed. His manuscripts, books, documents, everything was taken out of his house and brought to the NKVD building. Only one photo survived, which was hidden by Shao Qin. He was instructed to burn everything to the ground. But when the photo fell out of the book, he recognized Shakarim and hid it. He kept it for 30 years. From the memoirs of Kamilia Khabarkhaza, the daughter of Shakarim's eldest son, Gafur, in 1931, after our grandfather Shakarim was killed in the desolate steppe, my mother Makei and I were arrested as representatives of the bourgeois family and brought to the village of Karaul. There we were locked in a dark abandoned house. I was only 13 back then, so I was not yet able to grasp what was happening. All I remembered was the piercing cold of autumn in the dark abandoned room crawling with rats. We couldn't sleep at all that night, but an even worse ordeal lay ahead of us. Interrogations. Back then, the silhouette of Shunglestau in the distance seemed to me the scariest place in the world. I remember saying to myself, God forbid that I should return to this place if I manage to survive. For a long time, Shakarim's work were consigned to oblivion. Despite the decision of the USSR Prosecutor General's Office dated December 29, 1958, to rehabilitate Shakarim Khudabirdola for the lack of corpus delicti, the ban on the publication of his work persisted. This view of him as a bourgeois nationalist was still cultivated in the society. All our party members who worked with cultural issues, all the ideologists, all of them looked up the hierarchy. Whatever was the ideology at the time, they acted according to it. Even recognizing that Shakarim's works should be published, they were afraid. They used to say that they can't publish anything without an official order. They had this fear that the memory would be restored and historical justice would be served. Also, the condemned were killed without trial or investigation. For example, if we looked at a document from 1962 commission, Kayim Muhammad Khanov writes that Shakarim didn't commit any crime. The commission received a statement that there was no corpus delicti, and there was none. In 1959, at another appeal of the Rehabilitation Commission, the Security Committee fought very hard to prevent the rehabilitation of these names.
Можно, конечно, сжечь книги, фотографии. Of course, you can burn books and photos, but there are things that cannot be burned, things that endure. No matter how much Shakarim's legacy was forbidden and targeted for destruction, it persisted in the memories of the people who passed it on, recorded it, and safeguarded it, even at great risk, holding on to hope that these dark times will eventually pass and the truth will triumph. The first wave of rehabilitating the illegally repressed happened under Khrushchev after Stalin's personality cult was debunked, but Shakarim's works were still banned. First, Abzal Karasartov was still alive. Later, his descendants appealed to authorities, writing complaints to the Central Committee. Having the authority, having access to all the secret KGB archives, they cleaned them up, removed all the evidence. Of course, they were afraid that these people would be reborn. Having killed them once by shooting them, physically destroying them, they killed them a second time by consigning their names to oblivion. Them and their descendants, the henchmen of the Stalinist regime, fought all their lives to prevent the revival of these names by burning their photographs and works. And yet, there were people who were not afraid of persecution, such as Khayyam Muhammad Khanov, Hamid Yergali, and Yevney Biketov, who, in spite of everything, made every effort to return the poet and his legacy to the people. This letter was written by Ahat. The letter ends with the following words. And today, after the 22nd Congress of the USSR Central Committee, it was a blatant injustice that the name of one of the outstanding representatives of our culture would still be silenced. Before this letter, Kayum Muhammad Khanov wrote many times to the Abai District Party Committee, and in 1962, thanks to his petitions, a commission was formed to study Shakarim's life and works. And here is the document detailing how the commission worked and what it did. They interviewed 300 residents of the Abai region, recorded testimonies and so on. The commission concluded that Shakarim is a worthy son of the Kazakh people and that his works should be published. But since there was no instruction from the top, everyone was afraid to do this, but not Kayim Muhammad Khanov. The final rehabilitation of Shakarim and his work took place in 1988 after which many other prominent figures of the Kazakh nation were also rehabilitated, including the leaders of the Alash party. The commission to restore the good name of Alash figures, organized with the permission of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Kazakhstan, was headed by academician Jabai Khan Abdildin. On November 4th, 1989, we began our truly spiritual revival, having rehabilitated the names of the best sons of the Kazakh land. Here are some of the names. Alihan Bokeyhan, Ahmed Baytursunullah, Mirza Abdulatov, Temirbek Jurgenov, Mohamed Jantanishpay, Saken Sifulin, Ilyas Jantsugurov, Bimbet Mailin, Turar Ruskulov, and others. They are now buried here in their native land. The mausoleums of Abai and Shakarim, the two pillars of our culture, stand side by side, just like Shakarim and Abai went through life. They were like-minded people, they were close, but what a different fate they had. After his death, Abai was at the height of fame, and Shakarim was at the bottom of an abandoned well. This is the result of injustice that was happening in our land in the late 19th, early 20th century. We can reach a new level and not repeat it at all. Again, not forgetting Shakarim's precepts, which are as relevant now as ever. He wrote that the basis for a good human life should be honest work, a conscientious mind, and a sincere heart. These are the three qualities that should rule over everything. Without them, one cannot find peace and harmony in life. <laughs>